Good morning. Okay, let's invite our friends. Glad that you guys are here. Hopefully everything works smoothly. Yesterday we had internet problems. Fortunately, I can't control that. Um, let's see. Uh, Carol. Yep, I know we're on. And Lynn and Debbie, new regular recently, and um, Kathy, and then of course anybody else that wants to join in. Gina, good morning, Gina. Glad that you're here. Alrighty, well, we are going to be in First Kings 11, and we're talking about Solomon now. And we're going to go ahead and open in prayer. So let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I just thank you for this day. I thank you that you've given us your word. I thank you that we can come before you each and every day, and you have something new for us. Your word is amazing. You are our everything. You're our purpose. You're our hope. You're our sound foundation. And Lord, we just lift up the state to you, and we just ask that you would be with us, guide us, direct us, and show us what we need to do for you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Okay. Wet the hair and brush it out, and this is what we got. So we're going to go for that look today. All right. And again, we're in 1 Kings 11, and Solomon turns from the Lord. Not a good situation. Last few days, we've just heard about Solomon giving God all glory, honor, and praise. So totally devout to God and giving him all that he deserves. And now we're going to find out that he's going to turn from the Lord. So uh, Sol uh, 1 Kings 11.1. 1. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women. Mm -hmm. Along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives princesses and 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart for when Solomon was old his wives turned away his heart after their gods and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God as was the heart of his of David his father for Solomon went after Ashereth the goddess of the Sidonians and after Milcom the abomination of the um, Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. And then Solomon built a high place for Chemoth, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. This is huge because God had promised to take care of David, to always have one of his descendants on the throne as long as they followed after him. For him to do this meant that God was going to have to not fulfill that because they broke their promise. So the Lord raises adversaries. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord. The God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. For the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. And the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad, the Edomite. He was the royal house of Edom. Now, Edom, we remember, I don't think it's going to touch on it. Yeah, Edom was, we had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham 
had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the younger son. Esau was the older son. But Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew. And so Jacob became the blessed son, even though God had already blessed him before he was born. And Esau is of the nation of Edom. Esau begat the nation of Edom because there was always this animosity between Jacob and Esau for what Jacob had done. And he also stole the birthright and the blessing and, you know, bad blood. So Edom and Jacob were already at battle. So for when David was in Edom and, okay, so he was of the royal house of Edom. Verse 15, for when David was in Edom and Joab, the commander of the army, went up to bury the slain, he struck down every male in Edom. For Joab and all Israel remained there six months until he had cut off every male in Edom. But Hadad fled to Egypt together with certain Edomites of his father's servants. Hadad still being a little child, they set out from Midian and came to Paran and took men with them from Paran and came to Egypt, to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave him a house and assigned him an allowance of food and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh so that he gave him in marriage the sister of his own wife, the sister of Taphanes the queen, and the sister of Taphanes bore him Ganubath, his son, whom Taphanes weaned in Pharaoh's house. And Ganubath was in Pharaoh's house among the sons of Pharaoh. But when Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers and that Joab, the commander of the army, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, let me depart that I may go to my own country. But Pharaoh said to him, what have you lacked with me that you are now seeking to go to your own country? And he said to him, only let me depart. So Haydad is wanting to assert his authority. He's a grown man now. He's got a family. And now he knows that all the people that were against him are dead. And so he's wanting to go back there and maybe possibly get revenge, maybe possibly take back his throne and his country. And so he's asking Pharaoh that he could leave. I'm going to sign into the live stream because, like I said, sometimes I don't see who pops in. So hopefully... I can see this here. Let's see. You know, it's just technology. Gotta love technology, right? Okay. And I don't, I see one was on. I see somebody's on, but I don't know who you are. So if you link and join in, I can say, hey. Okay. Verse 23, 1 Kings 11. God also raised up an adversary to him, Reznon, Rezon, the son of Eliad, who had fled from his master, Hadazar, king of Zobah. And he gathered men about him and became leader of a marauding band. A marauding band. Pretty much just a bunch of killers. After the killing by David. And they went to Damascus and lived there and made him king in Damascus. He was an adversary of Israel all the days of Solomon, doing harm as Hadad did. And he loathed Israel and reigned over Syria. So the kingdom is slowly deteriorating because of Solomon's love for these other women who worshipped other gods and turned his heart away from the one true God. Okay, so verse 26, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite of Zeradan, a servant of Solomon, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also lifted up his hand against the king. There's just all these people getting in line to go against the king. And this was the reason why he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built the millow and closed up the breach of the city of David, his father. The man Jeroboam, good morning, Benny. Thanks for joining in. The man Jeroboam went out of Israel. The prophet ah Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him on the road. Now Ahijah had dressed himself in a new garment, and the two of them were alone in the open country. Then Ahijah laid hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 
ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and will give you ten tribes, but he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because they have forsaken me and worshipped Asherah, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemoth, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites, and they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight and keeping my statutes and my rules as David his father did. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David, my servant, whom I chose, who kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it to you, ten tribes. Yet to his son I will give one tribe, that David my servant may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen to put my name. And I will take you, and you shall reign over all that your soul desires, and you shall be king over Israel. And if you will listen to all that I command you and will walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did, I will be with you and will build you a sure house as I built for David and I will give Israel to you. And I will afflict the offspring of David because of this, but not forever. Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam ro arose and fled into Egypt to Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Wow. What a sad, sad list of events, right? So verse 41, now the rest of the Acts of Solomon and all that he did in his wisdom are not written in the book of Acts of Solomon. Oh wrong it's a question now the rest of the acts of solomon and all that he did and his wisdom are they not written in the books of the acts of solomon i guess so and the time that solomon reigned in jerusalem over israel was 40 years and solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of david his father and rehoboam his son reigned in his place rehoboam's folly chapter 12 first kings Rehoboam went to Shechem for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. And as soon as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt, for he had fled from King Solomon, then Jeroboam returned from Egypt, and they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam, Your father made your our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. And he said to them, go away for three days, then come back, then come again to me. So the people went away. The king Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon, his father, while he was yet alive, saying, how do you advise me to answer this people? And they said to him, if you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them, when you answer them, when they, they will, then they will be your servants forever because you win more with honey than with vinegar, right? Well, but he abandoned the counsel of the old men gave that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. And he said to them, what do you advise and what we answer that we answer this people who have said to me, lighten the yoke of your father upon us. And the young men who had grown up with him said, thus shall you speak to this people who said to you, your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus shall you say to them, my little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. Okay. And now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. That's not going to make you a popular leader. And guess what? He's not going to be a popular leader. And when you listen to poor counsel, that's what happens, right? So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day. As the king said, come to me again the third day. The king answered the people harshly and forsaking the counsel that the old men had given them, he spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add 
to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. God orchestrated this. God allows situations to happen in a certain way to bring about a certain outcome because he knows the choices we're going to make because we are all foreknew and predestined, right? He knew Solomon's son, uh, Rehoboam, Rehoboam, right? He knew Rehoboam was going to choose this way. He knew his heart. He knew his heart was far from God. He knew that this was going to happen. That's why he foretold Jeroboam everything that was going to happen. So it's not that God wants bad for us. It's God knowing our poor choices and the consequences that are gonna, they're going to cause and allowing those consequences to happen so he can bring about the good in any and every situation because he already knew the direction that was going to happen. And I know that's kind of hard to understand and maybe a little convoluted, but it's a faith thing as well. I can't fully explain how God works because then I would be God. So I don't pretend to understand all of it, but I do know by faith that I trust that God foreknows and predestines the situations to happen the way they do so God will get all glory and honor, right? The kingdom is divided. And when all Israel saw the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, what portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Look now to your own house, David. So Israel went to their tents, but Rehoboam reigned over the people of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent to Adoram, who was his taskmaster over the forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death with stones. That doesn't sound like a good death. And King Rehoboam hurried to mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. So Israel and Judah were divided, the north and the south, the kingdom of the 12 tribes, the northern 10 tribes against the southern two tribes. The southern two tribes being consisting of Jerusalem, Judah, the chosen places of God, the top 10 tribes rebelling against David, which they had every right to rebel at this time, but nevertheless, they were pretty much rebelling against God as well because, you know, it, it just works out that way. So, rebellion, uh, stoning, Ting kingdom is torn apart. That's where we're leaving chap uh, the Old Testament. And now we're in the New Testament. We're in the New Testament, Acts 9, and we're going to see the conversion of Saul. Saul, if you remember, is the one that was standing at the top of the pit where everybody was stoning Stephen and everybody laid their coats at his feet because he was in charge, because he was the one that was there watching over everything. He didn't have to get his hands dirty because everybody was doing his bidding. So... But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, Christians, the way of Jesus Christ, because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? Men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So now he's just out rounding up people, wanting to kill them for worshiping God through Jesus Christ, his son. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Well, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. 
He was blind. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days, he's, he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Because I'm pretty sure he's a little freaked out that the last thing he saw was the vision of God with Jesus Christ reincarnated, telling him that he was persecuting Jesus, who was God, who was of God, which he didn't know because he thought he was doing the right thing. Because a lot of times we get very fervent and very excited and very driven to do what we think is right. When then we find out it was completely wrong. Well, that's where Saul's at. So now, verse 10, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am. Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. Isn't that funny? The street's called Straight. That's where Saul's located, on the Straight Street. I think that's funny. I don't know. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. <laughs> but Ananias answered, uh, 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 Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Uh, just in case you didn't get filled in on that part of the story, Lord. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is, cho he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him much, I will show him how much he must suffer for the name of my, for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has, who appeared to you, on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. Ew. And he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. We have to allow the things that blind us in this world to fall away before we can walk in the way of God. We cannot continue to or start on our path to toward God blinded by the things that we're living in. And we can't be angry at those that we know that should be saved and that are should be walking in the way of God if they're blinded. You can't be angry at a blind person for not being able to see. They can't see. You can't be angry at that. We can pray for them. We can love on them. We can show them God by the, what we say and do, but, but we can't make them see. Only God can help them to make them see. Only God can give them the opportunity to change who they are. And only they can accept Jesus Christ and allow those things to fall away so they can see, right? So Saul proclaims Jesus in the synagogues. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem for those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Well, Saul's going to now escape from Damascus. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him because now the Jews realized uh, Saul's a traitor. He's not following what we tell them to do. Now he's following that Jesus guy. So their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night, led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. So Saul, blinded by a vision of God, by, by Jesus Christ, to follow after him and realize that he was on the wrong team, regains his sight, preaches and teaches about God, shares that Jesus is the one true God, and now he's on the run. Now, now he's being lowered over the wall, and we don't know where he's going, and we don't know what's going to happen to him. There's Saul. Poor Saul. Well, that's where we have to leave Saul, because now we're going to Psalms. Psalms, I have calmed and quieted my soul. Good morning, Raquel. Glad that you're here. We're in Psalms 131. 
Um, oh, Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy, occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. You know, it's not that he's depressed or he's um, got a poor self-image in this in this psalm. He's understanding that he that God is God and he is not that. Um, he might not understand the great and marvelous things that God has done. But as he calms and quiets his soul, as he sits before God and he wants to listen to him, he has hope. He has a purpose. He has a vision. And he's wanting to hope in God. And because of this calm, quiet soul, he's able to do that. Because he's trusting in God and he's calming and quieting where he's at. And that's a really hard thing to do in this day and age. And obviously it's a big deal to do then too, because he's writing about it. It's not like something they're all doing. Otherwise it wouldn't be a big deal. Calming and quieting your soul is, calming would be the opposite of stress, right? I'm gonna let all the other things pass away and I'm gonna focus on God. Quieting my soul means I'm not gonna be blaring out all my prayer requests, right? But I'm going to sit quietly before the Lord and I'm going to listen to what he has for me. That's calming and quieting our soul. It's not looking down on who we are, but looking up to who he is. Understanding that I may not have all the answers, but I don't need to because God does. That's the God we serve, right? Okay, so our last reading for today is Proverbs 17, 4 through 5. An evildoer listens to wicked lips. And we saw that with Rehoboam listening to the young council in our Old Testament reading instead of listening to the older men council. And he basically was an evildoer. He split up the kingdom. The young council, met, the young men that were on his council were wicked. Good morning, Kimberly. Glad that you're here. I wonder if you guys are speaking. I don't know. I can't. I don't think so. I don't see any comments. So, and a liar gives ear to a mischievous tongue. And so he's listening to the mischievous tongues of those that are there giving him counsel. Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. And pretty much Rehoboam was mocking the poor people of Israel who had come to him and asked for a reprieve, asked for Rehoboam to change what Solomon had put upon them, the heavy yoke that he had put upon them. And he basically said, well, it's going to be worse. And that was mocking the maker. That's saying, you know, you thought you had a hope in me? Ha! No, you don't. And that's, that's what he did. He was mocking the maker who could have blessed the people through him, but instead he cursed the people through him and allowed the kingdom to be divided. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. You know, you don't want to be around that person that just wants to um, cause problems, the gossip, the troublemaker. You know, he will get punished. And if you're with him, guess what? You're in on it and you're part of the punishment. You're going to be punished too. So don't, don't hang out with uh, calamity people, people that like calamity. Don't mock the poor. Don't uh, listen to mischievous people, and they have wicked lips. So there you go. That is our Proverbs for the day. Wow, that was a lot, right? God has so much for us each and every day. And I hope as you continue to listen that you would be blessed by what you hear and that you would um, continue to like, continue to share. Please add any comments or prayer requests into the section at the bottom. And um, thank you so much for your time with me. And I hope that you have a very blessed day.